So this video is an additional part to the hyperthyroidism video. And in this video, I just want to make four additional points that I did not make in the previous two parts of this video. Now, the first point that I would like to make is a correction to something that I said in part two of the video. So you'll remember in part two, we discussed the symptoms of hyperthyroidism and we came on to the neuropsychiatric symptoms that are listed here. And we said that hyperthyroidism can result in people feeling quite irritable and anxious and cause problems with sleeping and make them tremulous. Now that is all true. The problem is that I called these tremors that people experience in hyperthyroidism essential tremors. I even wrote it down. Here is the incriminating evidence here, essential tremors. Now, in the words of the great Dr. Najib, write this down and put a very big cross through it. In particular, put a cross through the word essential here. Essential means that the tremors are idiopathic, i.e. we cannot find an explanation for why someone has the tremors. So many people do have idiopathic tremors, and in that case, their diagnosis is essential tremors. However, if someone has tremors because of hypothyroidism, then of course those tremors are not idiopathic, and therefore they should not be called essential tremors. So that's the first point that I'd like to make, that Hyperthyroidism can cause tremors, but you mustn't refer to them, as I did, as essential tremors, because essential tremors are tremors that are, by definition, idiopathic. There is not an underlying medical explanation that we understand that is causing those tremors, whereas tremors as a result of hyperthyroidism, those are secondary tremors, not essential tremors. So, cross out the essential and never call the tremors of hyperthyroidism that again. Second point that I'd like to make is about one of the classic signs of hyperthyroidism, and we have a picture here. So one of the classic things that people associate with hyperthyroidism is bulging eyes, and the proper medical term for bulging eyes, well, there's two of them actually, it's called proptosis or exophthalmus. So proptosis is one of the medical terms for this, uh, and exophthalmus is another term. And I got this picture, by the way, off Google. It was one of the first uh, images that came up. Um, so I hope whoever it's a picture of is happy for it to be on the internet. Um, so proptosis exophthalmus is the proper medical term for bulging eyes. And this is a classic thing that many people associate with hyperthyroidism. However, it is not, and this is a really important point, it is not actually a sign of hyperthyroidism, which is why I did not put it uh, in the list when we were discussing the signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Instead, it is a sign or a symptom of Graves' disease. It is specifically part of Graves' disease, not part of the broader hyperthyroidism. It is not caused by having too high thyroxine levels. If I gave you a massive great dose of levothyroxine and took your thyroxine levels in your blood through the roof, you would not develop proptosis. Your eyes would not start to look like this. And the reason is that T4 being too high, the hyperthyroidism, is not what causes this. It is part of Graves' disease and it is another manifestation of having the antithyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibody. Uh, that is part of the autoimmune disease of Graves' disease. Now, for reasons that we do not properly understand, these antibodies are capable of stimulating the soft tissue, so the muscle and the connective tissue that lies behind the eye, between the eyeball and the bone. Um, it is capable of stimulating that tissue to grow. And when that tissue grows, it results in the eyeballs being pushed forward bilaterally like this. And that is why you end up with these bulging eye appearance where you can see sclera above and uh, below the iris here. That's called scleral show. So proptosis, exophthalmus, bulging eyes. It's also got another name, by the way. It's also called thyroid eye disease, TED for short. It is not part of hyperthyroidism. Many people mistakenly think that it is a sign of hyperthyroidism. No, it is a sign of Graves' disease. So if you see someone uh, with 
proptosis. Do not think hyperthyroidism. Think more specifically Graves hyperthyroidism, Graves disease. And indeed, all the other causes of hyperthyroidism that we've listed up here, so over-medication, thyroid hyperplasia, and thyroiditis, they will not result in bulging eyes. It's just Graves' disease. So that's point number two made. Point number three is I just want to talk about um, the way in which you would differentiate between these different causes of hyperthyroidism. So a little bit about diagnosis, and in particular, I want to talk more about the diagnosis whoops, of Hashimoto's thyroiditis and talk about some of the antibodies that you can test for for that. So Graves' disease then, you're going to have hyperthyroidism, you're going to have most likely a goiter, and you may well have proptosis. In addition, when we do blood tests, we will find the presence of the antithyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibody. So all of those things go together to build the picture of Graves' disease. In particular, if you ever see proptosis, you now know instantly start to think Graves' disease. Over-medication is going to be obvious. This will be someone on levothyroxine showing the symptoms of hyperthyroidism. The uh, thyroxine levels in their blood will be too high, and then it's evident that the reason for that is we've given them a too high dose of levothyroxine. Toxic multinodular goiter, they're going to have a goiter. They're not, in contrast to Graves' disease, going to have the proptosis or the antithyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibody. So the lack of those two things will point you more in the direction of toxic multinodular goiter than Graves' disease. Toxic adenoma, of course, they're going to have a lump on their thyroid gland that's going to be unilateral, um, and we can do a thyroid ultrasound scan and have a look at that lump, um, etc. So that's quite easy to diagnose as well. Hashimoto's now. So you'll remember from the video on hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's can result in either a goiter or it can result in atrophy of the thyroid gland. So it may well be that the thyroid gland doesn't become enlarged in Hashimoto's. So they may have hyperthyroidism in the Hashitoxicosis period, but no sort of visible palpable changes to the thyroid gland. In fact, the thyroid gland might become more difficult to palpate uh, as it atrophies away. So how do you diagnose Hashimoto's thyroiditis then? Well, this is point number three. Uh, there are some antibodies associated with Hashimoto's. So remember, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland. And in this autoimmune disease, there are two classic antibodies that can be found in people's blood. And these are the anti-TPO antibody. So anti-thyroperoxidase enzyme. So remember, the thyroperoxidase enzyme was crucial for producing thyroglobulin, a very important enzyme uh, of the um, thyroid tissue cells. So in Hashimoto's, you can actually end up with antibodies directed against this enzyme. Um, in addition, another antibody that you can find in Hashimoto's is anti thyroglobulin antibody, so TG for short. So remember, thyroglobulin is the massive polypeptide chains that are stored in the middle of the thyroid follicles and which contain a huge number of T3 and more T4 uh, molecules within them. And the thyroid cells can then break thyroglobulin down to release the T3 and T4 when they uh, see fit from the simulation by TSH. So in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, we check for both of these antibodies, anti-TPO antibody and the anti-thyroglobulin antibody. So antibodies directed against these two crucial thyroid targets. And the presence of these antibodies highly suggests Hashimoto's. That's a way in which we can diagnose Hashimoto's um, and come to the conclusion that this person's uh, hyperthyroidism may be a transient hyperthyroidism that's going to be followed actually by hypothyroidism and we can then make the diagnosis of hashitoxicosis. Right, so that's point number three. Final point then, point number four, and then I'll end this video. Point number four is with regards to what do you do if you have a patient who's bordering on hyperthyroidism, has a few symptoms, what then? So let's give an example. Let's say we have someone whose free T4 is towards the top of the normal range. So let's say it's 17 picomolar. Um, and their TSH is towards the bottom of the normal range. So 0 0.7, let's say. So evidently that is not 
actually hyperthyroidism yet, but it's bordering on hyperthyroidism. And let's say that they are symptomatic. So the reason we've done their thyroid function tests, and by the way, I don't think I ever said that in previous parts, uh, these tests, we call them the thyroid function tests in medicine, the TFTs for short. So the reason we did the TFTs is because they were symptomatic and we've now found that they are borderline hyperthyroidism. And let's say that the symptoms that they are displaying are not worrying symptoms. So let's say that they are showing heat intolerance, so they're feeling hot a lot of the time and they're sweaty a lot of the time and they may well have hyperdynamic circulation, so they may well have quite flushed skin. So nuisance symptoms, symptoms that people don't like, but not actually dangerous symptoms. What do you then do? Well, the answer is you have to try and convince them that it's a better idea to live with their symptoms, find ways to live with their symptoms. So wear less clothing, uh, buy a fan to cool yourself down, um, things like that, rather than actually taking on therapy. And the reason is that therapy for hyperthyroidism is not actually that nice. Carbimazole, the first-line antithyroid drug, makes a lot of people feel extremely ill when they take it. It is not a nice drug to take. It's a drug that people with full, proper hyperthyroidism need to take because their disease is dangerous, because it can lead to the cardiac arrhythmias, but it is not a nice drug to take. It's a drug that you only want to take if you absolutely have to take it. So people who are borderline hyperthyroidism with some of these nuisance symptoms, they are very unlikely to get the um, dangerous manifestations of hyperthyroidism because unless you have full-fledged hyperthyroidism like uh, thyroxine levels up in the 40s, you're unlikely to get the dangerous symptoms such as the cardiac arrhythmias, which are the ones that we're worried about. So in these people with borderline hyperthyroidism, we would rather try and convince them to live with their symptoms and tell them that we'll continue to monitor their thyroid levels to make sure they're not continuing to go up. Because, of course, if they do go into full-fledged hyperthyroidism, then that's dangerous and they do need to commence therapy. But we would be resistant to starting them on antithyroid treatment because of the side effects and because of how unpleasant um, most of these drugs actually do make people feel. So in people with borderline hyperthyroidism, you want to try and convince them to uh, find ways to live with their symptoms rather than commence antithyroid therapy because the drugs are unpleasant to take. But of course, you do need to monitor the situation because it may be that they're going to go into full-fledged hyperthyroidism. And once they're in full-fledged hyperthyroidism, they do need treatment because then uh, they're at risk of the cardiac arrhythmias. This is in contrast to people with borderline hypothyroidism. So in people whose um, free T4 is bordering on being low, so let's say 9.5, and their TSH is bordering on being high, or maybe it even is high, so let's say it's 6, uh, in those people, we may well commence therapy with levothyroxine, top them up with a little bit of levothyroxine, because levothyroxine is not such an unpleasant drug to take. It's usually makes people feel a lot better taking it. So we're much more ready to start uh, therapy for hypothyroidism when it's borderline than we are for borderline hypertherapy, sorry, borderline hyperthyroidism uh, because the treatment for hyperthyroidism is so much less nice to take than the treatment for hypothyroidism. And that's my uh, final point about borderline hyper and hypothyroidism. Thank you for watching this additional video.